Hello, everyone, and welcome to Writers Drinking Coffee. This is a podcast based on writers sitting around drinking coffee or red coffee, which is wine, and talking about writing, publishing, the whole creative process, reading poetry and stories. We don't censor ourselves, but we don't swear a lot, so please consider us PG-13. Today, your host is me, John Schmidt, and I am fortunate to have as my guest Raymond Miller, who I'm going to ask a few questions, but Because I had a recent birthday, yay birthday, I'm going to ask him to read a story first. This is episode 54. Read for me, Raymond, please. Read for me. What have you got? All right. First of all, John, thank thank you for having me on the show. Um, This is my second time around, and every time I come here, I I feel very honored. Uh, I'm a bit nervous, but as we see from the very first time, it, it... becomes easier as we move forward. So anyway, I'm going to read from my uh, story, Kentucky. It's just a few pages. I'll try and keep it as PG-13 as I can. All right. Um, Kentucky, a bite from the apple of yesterday. Kentucky hated her name. She had no idea why her mother named her after a state that neither of them could find on a map, a name that caused her endless taunting and teasing from small-minded children who would grow into small-minded adults. Kentucky once asked her, Where her name came from, she expected a wondrous tale from her mother, a story that would rival tin men and talking lions and evil witches. Surely there was some distant relative who saved an Indian chief from certain death. Possibly her name was hidden in the depths of the good book. Could she be in line in the line of Moses or Noah? Kentucky could be a princess of Israel waiting to return to her rightful place on the throne. Slowly, her mother looked at her and said, I like chicken. At 10 years old, Kentucky (laughs) insisted at 10 years old, Kentucky insisted that everyone call her Kay. The name sounded pretty and she just as soon used that as any other. That summer, Kay played barefoot in dirt roads and in fields of dandelions and grass, happy that she no longer named after a secret recipe. As an adult, she moved from her small town of soybean and sorghum to Little Rock, Arkansas, the capital city where it held factories and office buildings and restaurants. There, she discovered her new name had its own set of problems. People expected a petite, green-eyed mother with a strong-jawed husband, a woman with straight teeth and freckles across her dimples. Not Kentucky with her dark skin, her wild hair, and her wide hips and her country ways. It was better to change her name back to Kentucky than deal with disappointing looks at job interviews and appointments. Looks that asked, why ain't you white? She wondered why white people named their kids offsetting names like Austin and Aniston and Lux. Apparently, even white women didn't want white women's names. As Kentucky grew older, she felt more and more like her aunt Sadie. Sadie, her grandmother's half-sister, was a big, gregarious woman who always had a smile on her face. Sadie had full thighs and a body as plump as a Christmas turkey. She ate as much as she laughed and laughed as much as she ate. Until she got sick, sick, the catch all phrase from anything from asthma to syphilis to tuberculosis to cancer. Sadie got sick and wasted away while Kentucky was still a young girl. Watched slowly. Sadie dried up to nothing. Even her legs turned to sticks under her shapeless dresses. Finally, her laughter was still forever in death. Adult Kentucky knew sudden weight loss was no joke. She didn't panic when she shed pounds like water, nor did she rush to the doctor. Back then, when she was younger, the doctor gave up hope on Sadie early. But he was happy to take the family's money. And then when that ran out, he took as many pigs and chickens as they could hand over or sell. Aunt Sadie was doomed from the moment she lost a few pounds. Was Kentucky doomed? She didn't know. However, she saw her Aunt Sadie in her dreams. Young Sadie with not a care in the world. Big Sadie, the middle-aged woman who raised so many boys, and Sick Sadie, the woman who slowly wasted away. It was Sick Sadie who convinced Kentucky to visit the brown skin, not us, but something else doctor at the clinic. You're losing weight, the doctor said in English so rapid fire that she seemed to be speaking a foreign language. I know, Kentucky said. I hope I ain't, I ain't got the cancer. The doctor shook her head and mumbled something. What? What? Sadie asked. 
The doctor repeated, you're fine. You shouldn't worry. She was out of the room before Kentucky could make any sense of the visit. As Kentucky dressed, she cursed herself for being a fool. Her old pants and dollar store shirt only reminded her of how much money she just squandered. Money she needed for food, for water, for heat, for heat. She knew, but would never acknowledge that her next step was the emergency room. She'd have to be bleeding, feverish, or in severe pain, but the next, not us, but something else doctor would treat her. And then they, but they would look. And then she would know what was wrong. Maybe. The night Kentucky's life ended, she could have used the weight to keep herself warm. October was cold, even for Arkansas. It wouldn't snow for another month, but the wind would cut through her coat like rat's teeth, and the chill made her feet throb in her shoes and ache with each step. Her feet always pained her. In the morning, arthritis embraced her joints, swelling the tissues through what felt like flame. By the end of the day, her feet protested. She pushed them up and down stairs through every office building each day, every day as she cleaned. Halfway through the quarter mile walk home from the bus stop, Kentucky began to hear music coming from the next block. If she turned her head, she'd have seen the gang of boys dressed in blues and white standing in front of a, the only two story house on the block. She might have recognized the few of the oldest, some of them nearly 30 years old. She'd have remembered them as children not long ago playing basketball in the elementary school or filling Saturday mornings with sugary cereal and cartoons. When did sugary cereal turn into whatever they smoked down there? She allowed the questions to linger in her mind, but she also realized with dread that her grandsons would join them all too soon. The wind attacked her with rude hands, pulling at her hat, tugging to get down her collar and, 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 and pushing up her dress. She leaned into its anger without emotion. Even when the wind came for her again and again, hurling sticky, wet oak leaves, newspapers and burger wrappers at her, she bit she bit every bit of debris seemed to cling to her until she was forced to stop and pick trash from her legs. A burgundy impala passed. The shiny chrome head cop head caps glittered as the vehicle seemed to glide on soft purple lights. Hip hop blasted swear swear words at her over a heavy bass beat. One of the four passengers lobbed a beer bottle out of the window. She barely heard the glass shatter on the concrete sidewalk as the wind bit into her ears. Kentucky walked on. For some reason, Rodney came to her mind. Even with his lopsided smile, Rodney was no Sidney Portier, but she remembered all the times they'd run off to one of the colored motels in Memphis. They'd eat buckets of seafood, dance all night, drink until they couldn't stand, and get down all morning. Back in the day, Rodney was the man, and he was a real man, not like those children, these boys in adult form. She remembered his body. Rodney was, was hard, chiseled from mahogany. The thought of running her hand down his, through his uh, thick black afro over the sparse hairs of his chest and across his muscle stomach only reminded her of how long ago those days were. Oh, man, when they fought, he never backed down, but he never hit her. Kentucky could push Rodney's buttons until he was right hot white hot with rage and ran to go but the last time she seen him he looked his age Rodney limped on bad knees his fat belly turned into a gut so big he looked pregnant he was blind in one milky eye and had more hair in his ears than on his head but damn it given a chance she put some pep in that old man's step if only he still wasn't with that high yellow person he called a wife just the thought of Rodney in better days made her want to cry. She was almost home, and as if sensing the end of a long, long day, the wind kicked at her again. Yeah, that um, that story I wrote. Oh. Uh, thank you. That story I wrote and posted on uh, Amazon. I don't have a, a lot of stories on Amazon. Uh, but it's one of the few, and I'm very proud of each of them. So I'll make sure to send you the link right after uh, right after our discussion here today, John. And we'll be sure to put the link on your. Oh wow, I'm just you <laughs> yeah. totally. I totally got lost in that. And then I love the way um, the focus moves, and it, you know the past, the present, the name, the the being, and then all of a sudden Rodney. Rodney, who's Rod? Oh, that's who Rodney is. Oh, wow. That, but now I want to know, you know, do you have more stories like that? 
How did she die? What happened? Uh, oh, no, 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 no. The one thing I taught from my, I learned from my mother on the cookbook we published is uh, she'll feed you and you have all the samples you want. But once you ask for the recipe, she'll tell you, go to Amazon, and get the book. Here's a card. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I better get those links because you got me hooked for sure. Yes, yes. So um, that was great. You got anything else? That's That only took about eight no, seven minutes. So, you know, we got a little time. Feed me, Raymond. Feed me. Give me another I've, hit. I've I'll go to Amazon. More. I promise I'll buy something. Please. <laughs> hey, in fact, you don't you, you don't have to buy anything with being friends. So I might share it with you. But, uh, you know, you know how it is. Yeah. So uh, the second story I have prepared is from the novel I've worked on for a long time. And it's it's a it's a pride of my life and a bit of shame because it's a long time I've been working on this thing. Um, and uh, you know what? You don't need context. We'll just go into it from the train station. I remember my mother's face. She died so young that she was frozen in time with an eternal beauty that would never fade. I have 27 pictures of her. Only two from our time in Chicago. I have no pictures of my father. In fact, I can't even find his family. His name was uh, Freddie King. He was an orphan out of a small Georgia town that's not even on a map anymore. A few pictures clothes, three toys, and four books. Those were all I had when I came to Arkansas on a train that shook and rocked every mile of the way. I was 10 years old. Aunt Rachel met me at the station and took me to my new home. I don't remember what she said, but she tried to be nice to me. I I, I couldn't talk to her. Every time I looked at her, I just saw enough of my mother to make me so sad. She even had to tell me when to get out of the car after we arrived. Now, Rachel led me to a living room where a woman sat on a couch. Even in my grief and fatigue, I could tell that this woman was related to me. Uh, We shared the same dark brown skin and noses that could only come from Africa. Uh, There was something different about this woman's face. My mind knew something was off, but I couldn't process it, nor did I have the experience to comprehend the feeling in my gut. I'd never seen anyone so large. To my eyes, she seemed to confuse completely filled the couch built for three and and it was all new. I I needed a moment to get used to everything I was seeing and and I took things slowly when they were new. Scott, this is your aunt Sandra. We call her sugar because she's so sweet. Rachel said Sandra leaned forward with her arms out. Come give your auntie sugar some sugar. She said and chuckled at her own joke. Her hands seemed like claws bigger than my head. Her arms flapped like giant bird wings. I stepped back. I didn't want to go near. Scott, do as you're told, Aunt Rachel said. But I stood rooted on the floor. It it was the first time that I couldn't tell her how I felt, but it wouldn't be the last. Scott, what did I tell you? Aunt Rachel said. I could hear the warning underneath her breath. Come on, I ain't got all day, Sandra said. She waved her arms and I took another step backwards. Why your arms do that, I asked. I heard Aunt Rachel make a sound of a laugh that turned into a cough. Aunt Rachel's face did a turn that I learned to recognize. You saying I'm fat? No, ma'am, I said. Your arms look funny. You saying I'm fat? I ain't fat, Aunt Sandra screamed. Aunt Rachel said, Sandra, Sandra, calm down. I ain't got to be no calm. Aunt Rachel turned her red hot rage on Rachel. Aunt Sandra turned her red hot rage on Rachel and then lashed out at me. At least I ain't ugly. You ain't, I asked. I thought by agreeing with her, I could make her feel better. I ain't ugly. You ugly, she screamed. At least I ain't dressed like no damn Christmas tree. All them ugly colors on your clothes. I looked down at my clothes. My shirt was red with white buttons and a a chocolate stain across the chest. My pants were green. I wore light blue socks with my tennis shoes. An ugly Christmas tree, Sandra taunted. Those colors don't go together, fool. That's why you look like a scarecrow dressed up like a crown. When I dressed that morning, I put on the clothes I had. I was more concerned with where I would end up that night. And I thought, how many people had seen me walking around with clothes that didn't match? What did they think? I never felt such shame or anger at myself. I couldn't find the words to fight back. And nobody wants your ass in Chicago and nobody wants your ass here. You small and scrawny, your head's like a big fat can of corn. My hands went to my head. Was it shaped funny? Sandra, stop it, Aunt Rachel said. Why? She snapped. He know it's true. He ain't worth nothing but two dead flies. Sandra, why you do be like that? You heard him. He called me fat. I ain't fat. 
He's just a little boy, Aunt Rachel said. How you going to know any better, she asked. With effort, Sandra leaned back. That little boy looked like a Christmas tree, and his head looked like a big pine cone on top, she said. You look just like your mama. She was ugly. If they mentioned my mother, who I loved more than life and would never see again, I ran away. I slammed the back door on my way out. The last words I heard from Sandra was, I told you he ain't going to make it. Wow. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> so I, I got to tell you, I was listening to an episode of Red Green. who's a Canadian comic. And somebody asked him how he came up with uh, his character is Red Green, and the name is actually Steve Smith. And he said, oh, it's simple. Everyone's got an uncle like this. <laughs> and you just tapped into all the embarrassing moments I've ever had with all of my aunts. I, well, not all of them, but while I was well, there, <laughs> I could see it. I could <laughs> smell it. Oh, man. Yeah. yeah. I could. My chest started to get tight. I was like, oh, my God. So, thank yes, you. That's oh, I, it, there ain't no shame in writing that well. Um, I'm looking forward to reading. So let me. I got a couple questions for you if you got a moment, and they're <laughs> pretty straightforward. the The first one is, in this time of troubles, and this is definitely a time of troubles of, of <laughs> quarantine, or as some have said, quarantine. How are you inspiring yourself to write, or are you writing? Oh, okay, that's a very good question. Um, it's interesting because I, I, I do work a day job and, and I'm happy in the place where I work. But for some reason, there's just more and more to do. So before the COVID, uh, I had set hours, you know, uh, tasks that were just reasonable. Now it's just there, there are a lot more hours now that I don't even now when I don't have to get into a car or bus or a train and go someplace. So despite not having commute. Uh, there's just time that has to be put into work. Now, that cuts into the, the writing time for me. And so I've noticed that. So um, uh, I don't have as many hours. And in the weekends, you know, with the and I'm you know, I'm in Northern California and some of the cities still have the curfews going on right now. So if I'm going to do something, whether it's go out and get groceries or just walk barefoot in a park, um, <laughs> that's got to be done. So that means no writing. At immediately after work, you're gonna if you're gonna get out the door, you got to get out the door. So, uh, mm. so time's an issue. As far as inspiration is concerned, you sh- <sighs> ten minutes on Yahoo News that's inspiration enough. There's just there's so with the writing style that I have, I I take I take my own trauma and I put it on the page and I try and link it together because uh, um because I don't. People learn. People seem to appreciate things through story, and a lot of this. Oh God, we're gonna go into this now. Here we go. All <laughs> right. Appreciate th- no, it's it's okay. I I, I talked myself into this, so <laughs> people appreciate and understand through story, right? If you tell mm-hmm. them something, they might get it, but you attach a story to it, they really really appreciate it. The only reason we're dealing with these shitty ass, excuse me, it's PG thirteen, excuse my language. These crappy Confederate flags right now is because somebody attached this idiotic story that, oh, they were protecting their – they're defending their homes and their lives from these aggressors. You buy into that, suddenly you're out there looking like an idiot waving this frag around. You know, the, you, know, you know what it means. You know exactly what it means. You're lying and telling yourself. So if, if, if you can take a lie, attach a story to it, and people buy it, then maybe you can do the same thing with the truth. Right. I wrote this story and I, and I hate you're not supposed to explain your stories, but this is we're talking writing process. So I think it's more valuable with that. I wrote this story about this woman going to see a doctor and she's frustrated. She has no money. Mm-hmm. Right. And so that to me, that's more powerful and it tells more of the truth than talking to people about, you know, what are we going to do in our country about universal health care and have somebody say, well, who's going to pay for it? You know, bullshit like that. Well, obviously she can't pay for it. Obviously, something needs to be done. And you can see Kentucky. You understand where she's coming from. She's getting older, and this arthritis is not going to go away, but she still has to work. There's going to be a point where she can't, right? That's going to happen to you, (laughs) period. You live long enough, there's going to be a point where you can't work. So unless you have universal health care, you know, and you can just go in and you've worked your whole life, you paid into the system, now it's time for you to get back from the system, you're going Mm -hmm. to have a lot rougher time than you need to. So – 
Uh, yeah. Interjecting slightly, the the feelings Please. I had when she talked about her and uh, it's it's such a powerful writing technique because it smacked me right upside my head when she talked about her experience with her aunt because that's how you learn. You, you look at your yep. relatives, the people you know, and the other doctor, and it, you charted both a change in the American healthcare scene. We're bringing in a lot of doctors and you got in the, not just a, a racial difference in how people deal with medicine, but the, the gender difference, you know, women, no point. And, and you didn't do it by saying, I am going to explain the gender. It's like the, the doctor spoke English way too fast for, Oh, okay. I get it. And <laughs> I don't want it to be the cancer. Sudden weight loss is, Oh, wow. You, it just, yeah, and instead of thinking about it, I just felt it. So uh, going yeah. back to the, the comment about writing process, you are one step beyond show rather than tell. You're feel rather than show rather than tell, which oh. is really powerful. And oh. you, you did it. I, 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 I like how you say no explanation, and it's going to lead to the next question in a minute. Um, because... I don't need an explanation. This is this is what I'm feeling going uh, your point about we are a storytelling and someone's got a crappy story. I got to disagree with you. Someone was sold a crappy story. Um, the rise of the Confederacy is try to keep a bunch of people fighting each other so they don't look up and notice. Right? Yes. Yes. And uh, I don't want to go more into that right at this point because we're yeah. talking about writing here. We are talking about but, writing. You are so right. So speaking of talking about writing, uh, yes. I'm going to go back a little bit to a process question. You write incredibly for me, and I've read some of your other works, uh, visceral stuff, a lot of feeling, a lot of emotion, as I've said. But you are a Scrivener man. You are a plotter. <laughs> and that that's kind of weird. Can you talk a little bit about your process with Scrivener? Because um, Normally, one thinks of it being more of a pantser thing, pantsing being just writing, right? Mm -hmm. So, so <laughs> any comments on that, or am I making any sense here? No, you're making perfect sense. So just for our audience, uh, I'm explaining something right quick. There, uh, there are two schools of thought in writing, and you can mix, mix and match them as you want to. There is plotting and pantsing. Plotting is I have an outline that I follow that tells me exactly where I need to go. I'm, I'm going to start this work. It's going to be 20 chapters. I might change it, but I know exactly what's going to happen in chapter 20. Chapter three, chapter seven doesn't matter. I plot it out. Pantser is I just start writing. It'll take me where, you know, wherever it takes me. And um, it's interesting. You'd say that Scrivener is only for pantsers uh, because just when you said that, I would never have thought pantsers even need a Scrivener. Just jump into Word and go. Why not? You're pantsing. Who cares? <laughs> but... <laughs> but uh, as a pantser, Scribner allows you to move things around. So even if you wrote something for chapter three and you want to drop that between chapter uh, uh, seven and, and eight, you can literally take that file, move it to another place. Boom, you're done. There's no copying and pasting and trying to figure it out because they're all little chunks that are in distributed for you. Now, to answer your question, as far as uh, plotting is concerned, I can create an outline. In Scrivener, and each of the each of the uh, plot points has its own little file. Write to that. Decide. Wait a second. Instead of this being in chapter two, let me do a two A and try this instead. I never have to change the first one. I can write the second one and then make a decision from there. So it's very good at plotting. Plus, my plot or whatever I'm using, whether it's a, a, a an Excel file or Word file, just just to hold the plot or even Notepad, I can drag that drop into my Scrivener file. So I never lose it. So I'm like, where did the notes I had on this character go? Blah, blah. Nope. It's all right there within one place. So I am religiously pushing Scrivener because everyone should have it, pantser or plotter. Definitely. Okay. That's <laughs> that's what I needed to know. Um, I have to say, it, interestingly enough, I'm trying different structures on some of the poetry I'm writing because I'm trying to respond to this situation by writing poetry. And it's, it's a very strange thing. And I hadn't, yeah. Okay. You're going to make me go look at Scrivener again. So I'll go do that <laughs> and we'll figure it out. 
Definitely, and, definitely. Okay, so moving on to the next question. Mm. You don't write solely as Raymond Miller. Talk to me about pen names and why you use them and what's up with that. Okay, um, this is something I think Stephen King, I, okay, I can't say Stephen King. I don't know what famous writer uh, uh, put me on to this. But he said, or the person, it might have been she said, just write. Put your stuff out there. Don't worry about, you know, it being perfect. Assign to your name. Just do it. And for some reason, I can't accept that. You know, I look at uh, I look at a lot of these writers who are out there and I look at so not so much their books are perfect, but it's just there's a certain kind of consistency and quality there that I don't feel I have yet. Right. But I still have to practice mm-hmm. and I still want to get published. <laughs> so I've been using pen names as a way to just practice the things that I put out when I first started using pen names to the stuff I'm doing now. It's completely different. Right. And I don't uh, I still like the thrill of publishing, of getting something out there, the thrill of making, you know, making a little bit of money on this. But I still don't have the chops I need yet. And being a writer in the modern times is not like being, say, a musician. If you record something and it's just a cheery little beady kind of thing, like, yeah, great. By the end of your career, you're doing some stuff that's, well, <laughs> if you're a jazz musician, by the end of your career, you're doing some stuff that's complicated and people can appreciate the growth. But as a writer who's trying to sell commercially, I don't feel mm-hmm. that we're allowed the same kind of leeway. I don't I don't think so. I mean, even though you are changing and there is a difference between the first and the second uh, or even the beginning of the career, the end of your career, if you're writing a five a five book series and people see that growth in that series. No, they want a certain consistency all the way through that series. So, I mean, it, just, it might be me, but because of that of that conclusion, I drew right or wrong <laughs> anxiety or no anxiety pen names. Hone your craft, get to where you want to be before you start putting your own name on stuff. Right. Oh, OK. Yeah. yeah. I got to tell you uh, three things. I know way too many things. The first is, yeah, <laughs> uh, I see your point completely. Your true fans, when you develop them, when, you know, your stands, as they say now, who are listening to your your fantastic jazz albums or in your case reading your fantastic evocative writing we'll figure out your other names and go hunt them down and read them and say oh yeah you can see the brilliance starting to emerge here uh and then they'll sneak up on you and buy you a drink hopefully that's my plan uh (laughs) but one of the best use of pen names i've seen is and i i I always mention her ursula vernon has a pen name she uses her main name as the name that allows her to write kids books Yes. Not PG at all. Uh, they're very much general. Everyone, no swearing, no, no non cartoonish uh, kid violence. Not really a lot of violence. There's conflict, but not violence. And then when she gets into more adult themes or really good horror, unfortunately for me, who doesn't really read horror well without sleepnesses, she uses another name, T. Kingfisher. So. I really want to thank you for your viewpoint on this because it's yeah. one that hadn't occurred to me at all. And one that I may want to consider for some of my writing, uh, for those people who are unaware, I actually have the book. Everyone keeps mentioning works is because of an offhand comment by Raymond. And, um, sometime in the next couple months, I'll come on and read a couple sections of it so you can laugh at me. But you did inspire it with one of your comments. Oh, I, that's that was a cheap shot so that you can hear it. And uh, thank you for that. Um, it's been a joy and a delight. So we're kind of reaching the end of time. We don't have to end. Is there anything else you want to say right at this time? Uh, you know, now that you mention it, uh, just right quick, it, especially young people. And if you're beginning writing, uh Especially if you go with the pen name direction, be fearless. Be fearless. There's no one knows who you are. You don't have to be a um, an a hole about it. But get out there, experiment, do different things. If you want to write your big science fiction story, do your big science fiction story. You know, just start putting stuff on paper and just start rolling. You know, you don't you don't have to be per- even though I just had said I have anxiety, I have to be perfect before I use my my real name. Don't worry about that. Just get stuff written get it on paper hone your craft i was sitting at a a seminar uh for romance writers 
And uh, this woman looked at me <laughs> and, you know, comments always help us, you know, positive things. She looked at me and said, what do you really want to write? You know, you're doing this thing like and I said something on the lines of uh, I wanted to write some uh, detective novels in the style of my favorite author, Walter Mosley, oh, Walter Mosley. Oh, my God. <laughs> and she just looked at me and everyone in the, in, the, in the table just went silent, staring at me I'm like, what, what? Is something wrong with Walter Mosley? It's like, no, no. The way my face lit up. The, the excitement that I brought up, she said, that's what she noticed. And she's like, OK, you need to get to work on that. So I'm working and I'll actually um, I'm a bit I have a bit of anxiety around the controversy because I'm going to dig on this thing. I'm going to dig hard on this thing, especially with uh, uh, the recent events in uh, Black Lives Matter. But I'm I'm working on a five book series, uh, crime novels, and it's just. I, as a plotter, it's it's almost plotted and I'll just have to start and start cranking and take my own advice. I'm very excited about it. So at a certain point, I will be on the show and I will be reading it. And, yeah, we'll see where it goes. We'll and I'm see. looking forward to that. Before we get to that, though, since I don't know Walter Mosley, can you recommend a couple of his books off the top of your head? Uh, I would start with The Devil in a Blue Dress. Devil in yep. a Blue Dress. Okay. Devil in a Blue Dress. And then uh, that's the... This man, in the 30 years, he's put like 5,000 books and I've barely got a few things written. It's a little, he's my inspiration. I, I treat him as the rabbit that I chase. You know, it's, you know, if he can do it, I can do it kind of thing. But that's the first book in his uh, Easy Rolling series. There are um, uh, other series, but they all star um, black men, heroes, you know, in the hero heroes. kind of thing. Yes, black male heroes. And you don't always see that. So he has a um, some science fiction, you can, it, most of the, most all the science fiction is independent. Um, so there's no, nothing about jumping in the middle of series. So pick up any of his science fiction books. I'd start with devil in a blue dress. And if you can read that and not fall in love with it, you know, then he may not be the writer for you, but trust me, that man's got some chops. That man has got some chops. Woo. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you. I'll go look that up. Um, wow. Thanks so much for coming on the show. And you're definitely going to, I'm definitely going to ask you back again. I love talking to you. Thank you, sir. Well, Be thank fierce. You the time. I love the advice. Be fierce and do what you love. So yes. this has been listen. You've been listening to writers drinking coffee, a labor of love and definitely enthusiasm put together by the hosts. Our main support Magic is brought to you by Deirdre McGaffey Schwein, and our sound engineer and backup web spider is Dave Welsh. Our intro music is Pretty Made Milking a Cow, and our exit music is Breakfast with a Morning Person, both by Michael Engberg. You can hear more from Michael Engberg on manyhatsmusic.com. As usual, we'll put a lot of information in the liner notes. I hope you find it useful. Our podcast sponsor... Today is still Jackal Designs, yay, enabling you all to be able to buy a cool writer's drinking coffee swag. Thank you, Raymond. Mm-hmm.